Pablo. Pablo, you're silenced. <laughs> you can't send him a message or call him on the phone. Yeah, I'm telling him to unmute. Ah, now. I met uh, Valint in 1984 in Budapest. That was the first mathematical physics that meets East Meet West conference in Kosek in 1984. Uh, Valint is uh, Romanian. Uh, he was uh, his uh, bachelor degree in the University of Bucharest. And then he went to Hungary and got his PhD in the Hungarian Academy of Sciences in 1998. Then he got more recently in 1999 an emeritus professor at this academy. Uh, he worked in several departments of mathematics at Heriot Watt in Edinburgh when he was a postdoc and after that, and then in Hungarian Academy of Sciences and University of Technology at Budapest, in Bristol, where he's uh, now, and in the Alfred Rennie Institute in Budapest, where he's now also. Uh, he was associate editor of several uh, journals, important journals, like the Acta Mathematica Hungarica, the Annals of Applied Probability, where was editor, chief editor also there, then the Annals of Probability, the Electronic Journal of Probability, where he was editor, and the Annals de l'Institut Henri Poincaré, where he was associate editor. He was invited speaker at ICM uh, 2018, was elected member of the Academia Europea in 2016, got the Phil Tibor Memorial Medal from the Academy in Hungary, and then he got the Ignite Cross of the Hungarian Republic in 2010, but this was returned as a part of an uh, anti-racist movement of the scientists against uh, another subject that got this night cross but was uh, declared racist. He, uh, Balin has an extremely academic, uh, active academic life, he has very many, many uh, in, publications in several themes. I like especially his work uh, with Werner on the um, self-avoiding walks. And the famous now uh, Toth model where he related the steering process of the simple exclusion process that is an interacting particle system with the Bose-Einstein condensation uh, for a free, uh, the free case in the um, Feynman representation. This was really very nice. Uh, uh, he organized also dozens of conferences and was invited at many conferences. And one important point was when he gave a plenary talk at the Stochastic Process and Applications meeting in Buenos Aires in 2014. Uh, we, I am, uh, we are extremely happy to accept he accepted to give uh, this talk in our colloquium. So, Valent, please start. So, thank you, Pablo. Thank you very much. This was really nice. And, and uh, yes, so it's 36 years since we first met when you came to Budapest. It's absolutely, it's, it's more than half of, of my, half, my, my lifetime and about the same for years. So, we have a long, trajectory when to, which we passed together with Pablo and an old friendship. And I also have very, very fond memories about my visits to, to Rio de Janeiro, to Sao, uh, to Sao Paulo, and to Sao Paulo where Pablo was, was uh, living for many years. And then of course, this last one to, to Buenos Aires a couple of years ago. So, so thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me to give this talk, which is a pleasure of mine, and, and I'm more than happy to do it. Now, I was warned that this is not a probability uh, seminar, but a general colloquium, and therefore I will not go very steeply to the probability part. My plan was the following, that I do a sort of historic background of Brownian motion which might, you might find boring, but I don't think it is boring. It's a most interesting intellectual history of a notion which became very deep mathematics. 
And after then, about 20 minutes of history, I go to the two, my, the, the, the mathematical topics I'm, I'm going to speak about. So that's why the titles of these slides, title of these slides is Brownian motion and Brownian motion between quotes. And by this, I tell you from start what I mean that, and I want to emphasize the difference between, between the physical phenomenon, which we call Brownian motion, that's without, without the quotation marks, that's the physics. And with quotation marks, that's the mathematics, which we try to do, invent models of it and so on. And let's see how the two match and what is the difficulty. And as you know, many of you, or most of you, or all of you, so the story started with, or at least the, the officially told story, started with Robert Brown's observation under this microscope. This is his original microscope, I think. Uh, of, of the motion of suspended particles in some fluid and this totally jittery and random agitated motion, which she didn't understand at the time, that's almost 200 years ago. And of course, with hindsight, we know what it was caused by, but at the moment, it, at the time, it was the most interesting thing that, that as, is, as if these little particles would live and would, would move uh, under some living, uh, as some living organisms. Now, it turns out that he was not the first one to notice this jittery motion of suspended particles. It was about 50 years before this Dutch gentleman, uh, Ingenhaus, already, already noticed very similar things. So we call it Brownian motion, but we could call it Ingenhaus and Brown. And actually, this is not the beginning of the story. If you look deep, deep when you dig a little bit deeper into the history, you notice, or those who dig, notice that actually, more than 2,000 years ago, <laughs> or, uh, Lucretius Carus in De Rerum Natura, that he describes already, here, here you find the English translation, he describes already some phenomenon like this, that particles move in a very, very apparently totally, totally random way uh, in the fluid, suspended in fluid. Of course, what he noticed was physically a different thing, actually. Here you see, so what, what Robert Brown and Ingenhaus Notice was on the scale as we know today, on the scale of 10 to the minus seven in meters, while, while uh, Lucretius's observation was on the scale of 10 to the minus four, namely, okay, so the particles were different. This is a reconstruction, a rational reconstruction. By now we know that the Brownian motion is motion of a particle suspended in fluid, which is kicked away, it moves according to some deterministic rules, Nevertheless, it looks like random. And what, what, what Lucretius noticed was something of something different. But what's very interesting that, that the phenomenon is the same at different scales of different scales of, 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 of lengths, very similar things are observed. So this is some sort of, of universality. Now the history continued, and the next stage came with Einstein, actually before Einstein, half century before Einstein, Adolf Fick wrote down this, this partial differential equation, which is the mother of all partial differential equations. We, told, we call it today either heat equation or diffusion equation, which is supposed to describe diffusion of, of the density of a fluid uh, according, of course, we know it all well, this is Laplacian, change in time. It's a very interesting thing which I learned recently or when I prepared, not this talk, but not long time ago, that Adolf Fick actually was the academic grand, great grandfather of Einstein. So Adolf Fick is PhD student, was Einstein's PhD advisor's advisor, which is very interesting because Einstein, you will see on the next slide, what Einstein did in his famous paper in 1905 is, was trying to link the macroscopic phenomenon, this described by fixed equation, by the diffusion equation, to give some microscopic explanation in terms of particles moving around. Till Einstein's work, nobody tried to understand this diffusion phenomenon in terms of particle motion. And Einstein was, and Smolukovsky were the first who realized in 1905, 1906 published their work, who realized that actually there is something microscopic going, and this is very important for us, going on there. So there is the ma ma macroscopic partial differential equation, 
but actually it's related to microscopic motion of particles. And that was the most important observation of Einstein and, and later Smolukowski, relating the macroscopic equation with the microscopic, what you see here, some constant appearing in the macroscopic equation described, identified with the square, mean square displacement of a microscopic object. This is a very important observation. Today, today we think about it as most natural, but at the time it was absolute revolution. And here you see another main actor of the story, Marian Smolukowski. Unfortunately, I didn't find a, 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 a postal map with his, with his, with Smolukovsky's, but I found this picture with his wife. I think it's very, very lovely how they dance here. And Smolukovsky has had this paper published 1906. It's a very deep mathematical paper. And all what we know today, what we call today the Kolmogorov Chapman equation and Markov property and things like that are there in that paper describing Brownian motion, what we call today mathematical. Brownian motion, so diffusion of particles. It's a very sophisticated, by the way, Smolkovsky's paper is mathematically more, in, more sophisticated than Einstein's. People don't, than Einstein's paper, people don't quite know this. And another main, main person in this story is, and there are more, many more, but Jean Perrin at the same time, so belonging to the same, to the same, to the same chapter of this history of I'm trying to understand the mathematics behind Brownian motion was Jean Perrin, and here you see a picture. This is taken from Perrin's book, Les Atomes, which was published in 1912, where he describes already diffusion in terms of microscopic motion of particles. And as you see here, this is taken. What you see here, you would say that it's, it's uh, created by a computer simulation, a random walk created by a computer simulation. No, this is not like that. This is a micro, an observation, Perrin's observation of a trajectory of a particle under deterministic motion colliding with other particles in a, in a, in a fluid. So this is, this is physics, not, not, uh, mathematical, uh, not mathematical modeling, what you see here. Good, so if you want to rationally reconstruct what Einstein, Smolukovsky, Perrin and some others did, this is not the way they spoke about it, but if you read carefully, in particular, Smolukovsky's paper, they identified the motion of a suspended particle moving or a diffusing particle moving in a fluid, like what we today, on our today's language, this WT would be the trajectory as function of time. And in today's language, we would call it that it has independent increments. You see these increments, that means the change in position in non-overlapping time intervals be independent, stochastically independent. That means what independent random variables mean. Be stationary in time. That means that if I shift time by this T naught, then the, the laws and the expectations, covariances and so on do not change and continuous sample path. So that means that this trajectory be a continuous, continuous function of time. Now, this is a rational reconstruction. This is not how they spoke about it. But with hindsight and with our today's knowledge, this identifies an object which today we call mathematical linear process or Brownian, Brownian motion. So from this, just as a bonus, you easily find the distribution of, of the displacement being Gaussian. This is a Gaussian distribution. In, this is written in one dimension. That's a mistake. I should have written a dimension. No, dimension is there. Sorry. No, it's in D dimensions. It's good. Good. So uh, from these rules, you actually will get this one as well. Now, this is easy to say that there is, that, that, that it's described by a process that has these properties, uh, independent and stationary increments and continuous sample paths. It's not so easy to establish mathematically that such an object does exist. Because imagine this would mean, okay, for those, I speak to those who are not probably but mathematicians, but other ana analysts, I don't know, other specialties in mathematics on, in the audience, 
This means constructing a probability measure on the space of continuous functions on the interval over the interval zero one. So that means that infinite dimensional functions, uh, function space, but construct a probability measure on that space with some given properties. It's absolutely not clear that this object does exist. And the big, the big next step was that done by, by Norbert Wiener in the early 20s and later redone in a different way jointly with, with, with Paley in 10 years later, where he indeed constructed, he gave a mathematical proof of construction of that this object does exist. So that on the space of continuous functions, there exists a probability measure with this and that properties which were listed before, absolutely non-trivial. It's, it's a very, very deep mathematics. It's not easy to do. And that was done by Wiener, and therefore today we call this the Wiener process, what others call the Brownian motion. And here are the rules I'm not going to tell you, but it's difficult functional anal analysis here. Fourier analysis and convergence and uniform convergence of, of full, with, with random Fourier coefficients and so on. It's a very, very difficult story. Well done and properly done by, by, by Wiener and later done by also by Paul Levy in a different way, in a more transparent way. And in this book, Paul Levy has everything you want to know about, about uh, Brownian motion, about what we call mathematically Brownian motion. But this is what I call between quotation marks Brownian motion, because the physical Brownian motion is not this. The physical Brownian motion is the phenomenon which Perrin described in this book, Les Atoms. And of course, there is some mathematical modeling here, which I'm not going to, which goes back 200 years more in time. Uh, that means 300 years from today back, namely deriving from random motion. So just by axioms, constructing some random motion, which has this property as the central limit theorem first proved by the Moivre. This story started with the Moivre and ended with Kolmogorov or uh, Paul Levy in the mid 20th century. So it's a 200 years story of proving the central limit theorem for, from sums of independent random variables. And let me just go very fast now among the main, the main actors and not all are, are listed here. Anyway, there is a huge mathematical construction which is random walk and limit theorems and constructing Brownian motion from random walk. Here you see Paul, this is Paul Erdős, by the way. Uh, and how to derive from random motion. The, this, this jittery, this, this what, 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 what should describe as a mathematical model of Brownian motion. But the main message of mine of these first couple of minutes I, I, I used already from my talk is that here we have a mathematical model, which we call in, in probability Brownian motion or, or Wiener process. And on the other hand, we have a physical phenomenon. And creating a mathematical model for a physical phenomenon doesn't mean deriving, doesn't mean fully understanding, because our goal should be to go to first principle of physics and derive from first principle of physics these rules, uh, these, these, these motions. So take, what, what, what is the problem here? That in true physics, this particle which moves around doesn't move according to random walk. It's not the case that, that there are independent steps which add up and from, so proving limit theorem for sums of independent steps is not, I don't say it's easy or trivial, but it's done and it's well understood. But the problem with the physical phenomenon is that it's not independent steps what, what, what is building up the motion of a, from which uh, the motion of this, of this tech particle is built up. Nevertheless, in the limit, in the scaling limit, we expect this uh, Brownian motion as behavior. And this is a very, very deep problem, which I, my mathematical part of my talk will be about. So, it started about the same time. So the message here is that there is a deeper problem or a, another very deep problem beside constructing the mathematical model, namely derive it from the physical phenomenon, first principle of physics. And now I am there at the topics of my, of my lecture. About the same time when Einstein, so in 1900, you see, uh, 
1905 or 1906, about those time, Hendrik Lorenz, this is Hendrik Lorenz, who you, you all know his name, he got Nobel Prize for many things he do, he's done in physics. The Lorentz transformation, for example, is due to him, which is the basis of, of relativity and many other things. And this is Ludwig Boltzmann. And the, these are two other main actors of, of this history. So Hendrik Lorenz came up with the following, with the following proposal of, 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 of modeling, for modeling transport in, in, uh, in either in solids, or in an uh, disordered, disordered medium. Maybe it's easier to understand first in solid. Place random, uh, place not random, place scatterers, say spherical scatterers, which have infinite mass. These are placed in a periodic arrangement, place them in a periodic arrangement, totally deterministically, they are there. They have infinite mass, they don't move from them. Start a particle with mass one, say, with some velocity, but the velocity be chosen randomly. The only randomness I put into the story is the, the random orientation of the initial velocity. And let this particle move around according to the deterministic rules of Newtonian mechanics. Namely, it scatters you can write down explicitly what the scattering rules are. I will not write down formulas, but it's like billiard, like a billiard ball scatters away. You have random is coming only from the initial distribution, from the initial velocity, which is chosen randomly. And let this motion go on for a long time. Can you prove this is a random? It will be at, after time t, t is large. The distribution, the, the position of the of the of the this motion will be randomly placed because there was a random initial choice of initial, this initial velocity. Can you say something about this, about the position after late time of this particle, after long time of this particle, where you don't add, the, the main thing is that I don't add extra randomness at each step, the, the, the scatterings are deterministic. There is very long memory in the, sto in the story because, because once you start here, by some chance it comes back, it will remember that there was a particle there. So it, it has long memory. So this is the periodic, and this is what we call Lorentz gas, periodic. The random Lorentz gas looks somehow more uh, friendly, maybe in a sense. Now I place the scatterers, still infinite mass, spherical scatterer placed in space randomly now according to totally random distribution, we probably we call it Poisson point process. If you don't know what it is, mean imagine that it's as random as it can be. So you have a box of some size, you have a number of balls of some, some number and place the centers just randomly independently in the box and take a limit when the box is huge. And now again, once these scatterers are placed there, they are there, no, don't move. Start a particle from some point you call the mm -hmm. origin. Question? No. Start a particle with some random initial velocity and let it move along with totally deterministic scattering. So the dynamics is absolutely deterministic. Randomness comes only from the position of the scatterers in this, in this random case and from the initial velocity and the rest is totally Newtonian deterministic ask about, call x sub t, the position of this particle at lane time t, and uh, ask about its position. Now, can you say something about this? I mean, when I ask, can you say something, or can you say about the distribution of this late time uh, position, something meaningful, something mathematically meaningful? And again, let me emphasize that it's not random walk. It's not that you add up independent steps, because the steps, are by no means independent. They are random because the initial conditions were random, but it's not at all independent. Can you prove something like, uh, okay, let me say central limit theorem. So that asymptotically after a long time, properly scaled, it will behave like it will be distributed according to a Gaussian. And the last sentence about these slides, because I will go to the more mathematical slides now, there is a limiting procedure which will be relevant. In my, uh, in, my, in my mathematical story, namely what we call the Boltzmann grad limit. Boltzmann is this guy, Ludwig Boltzmann, you know, his, you know his name, I'm sure, because he's the most famous person in, 
in classical study, the heroic times of classical statistical physics. And Grad was Harold Grad. He was a PhD student of uh, of Courant in the in the late forties at the Courant in New York. And anyway, he got a very difficult problem from his PhD advisor to solve. And this limiting procedure is named after them, which means the following: I decrease. So this is somehow the same picture, but. Looking, looking from far away, but not only by looking from far away, as I look from far away, I also shrink a little bit the, the size of the scatterer. So it's, I, will, I will give formula for that in a moment. So it's a particular limit you take. And in this limit, the flight times become uh, about order one. So if, you, if I just shrink, if I just shrink this picture, then the flight times, of course, will shrink, will be very, very short. If I want to keep the flight times of order one, I will have to rarify to, to, to the, that the relative, the relative density of the scatterers be small. It's, it's shrinken, but the relative, uh, yes, what I want to say, the relative area covered by scatterers is decreasing. So it's this, this limit. I will be very specific about this. And this limit will be, will be meaningful. And I'm going now, I will, Go now to another side of slide. So this was my, uh -huh. probably I have to unshare and share again. For some reason. Give me a second. Uh -huh. And here comes my, my, my mathematical story. So far, it was, it was, just, uh, it was just historical, historical uh, comments. So, and by the way, it's a joint work with, joint work with a young colleague from, uh, who was at, at Bristol at the time. He was a PhD student. Now he's a postdoc at Rutgers. And uh, Valent, Valent, are you sharing now? We, Am I not sharing? Sorry. I'm sorry. Yes. How about? Am I sharing? Yep. Sorry. Yes. Yes. Because it was. It. I had to unshare in order to change the PDF, and then I forgot to share it again. Sorry. So this is a joint work with Chris Lutzko, who is, uh, as I told you, and it's just appeared a couple of weeks ago in Communications in Mathematical Physics. So it's fresh work, and it's that problem retaken, which I where I stopped before. And here you see exactly the same picture. So here is the periodic Lorentz gas, and here is the random Lorentz gas. And this means, as I told you, that you have, and my, I will concentrate on this one later, that you start with randomly placed scatterers, but once they are there, they don't move. And then you start with a random initial velocity of this green trajectory, and you let it go as it goes. And I ask about, about the trajectory of the particle, right? Uh, and you see all the definitions here. And uh, uh, let me emphasize the dynamics is Newtonian deterministic, only the initial condition is random. And the big question is to prove a central limit theorem for the displacement. X is the position of the particle at late time. Let scale the time, as you see, scale the space by square root. So this is what we call diffusive scaling. And you ask about what you can say about the distribution of this. Right now, the periodic case is is much better understood than the random case. This is the periodic case. This is the periodic case. The periodic case is hard. It's terribly hard. But there is a big theory there, namely hyperbolic dynamics, which helps because by since it's periodic, you can look at it periodically. You can periodicize everything, and it becomes a dynamic hyperbolic dynamics on a compact manifold. And there is much known about that. So it's, it's a hard problem, but it's well understood and not fully understood, but well understood. And much less is known about the randomly placed, which looks like easier in a sense because you have, add more randomness. Nevertheless, the true difficulty is still there that only initial conditions are random. And there, is, there are no tools because, because there, is no, there is no dynamical systems uh, approach to it. So it's a truly open problem, much less understood. And 
let me just emphasize that the, what I told them, that the rent, I will, I will speak of the random positions. So randomness comes from, from the positions and from the initial velocity and the holy grail, I don't speak now about Quench and Hill because time is short. And the holy grail is here to prove the central limit theorem without any change. So just choose, you have to choose something, namely that the density, that the relative volume occupied by the, by the scatterers be smaller than a fixed critical value. Because if it's not slow, smaller than that, then for, due to some percolation arguments, you will be totally surrounded. There will be no way to diffuse. So if you, if you want to let way to diffuse, then you must assume that the relative volume occupied by scatterers is less than a critical value. Let's assume that. And, and the holy grail, which is absolutely out of sight, I can't, nobody can have a, has, a, has, has, has an understanding how to do this, to prove a central limit theorem, to prove that, that this displacement scale diffusively, the, its distribution converges to Gaussian as expected, what Einstein imagined about, about a similar problem when, when deterministic dynamics and the initial conditions. This is totally, totally open. I will not answer this question. And here is the Boltzmann ground limit, which I mentioned before. The Boltzmann ground limit is this limit. So that let the density of the, of the points, the centers of particles go to infinity and the radii of the spherical scatterer go to zero in such a way that this product rho times r to the d minus one goes to say one, a constant. It could be anything else, but a positive constant, finite positive constant. Note that this means that it's not just shrinking, the just shrinking would be r to the d put here, but it's not r to the d, it's r to d minus one. That means that the radii go down a bit faster than just by shrinking the picture. And this is a meaningful limit and you easily convince yourself. It's an elementary exercise for anyone who did a little bit of Poisson approximation, elementary probability, that if you look in this limit, you, you, you just ask about what happens till the first hitting, till the first, first hitting, till the first collision. You can easily prove that this will be in this limit of order one, actually the free flight distribution will converge to an exponentially distributed random variable. This is easy. And if I ask you to prove what happens in the first two between up, up to the second collision, probably you will be able to prove with some work that this will be two consecutive exponent, independent exponential flights. The change of velocity when collision happens will be governed by some, by some rule, which, which is a Markovian rule. And, and that's computable. If you, I ask you what happens in the first three flights, it's a bit more difficult. And I tell you why it's more difficult because, because there is memory in the problem. After two collisions, it could come back to collide with the same, with the same scatterer he started from. So it becomes the memory effect comes in. So that's why the problem is difficult. But what this gentleman did, Giovanni Gallavotti back in, you see when, and Herbert Spohn, these are good friends of Pablo's and of mine, some, uh, they proved that in this Boltzmann grad limit, so if you look at the trajectory I spoke about, and under this limit, but in a fixed time interval, in a, in a compact fixed time, that's very important, time, no matter how long, but fixed time interval, it will converge to a random walk. It will converge to what you expect, namely fly, collide, fly, collide, fly, collide, and the flight times are independent exponentially distributed, so it's easy, and the collisions are, you can, you can explicitly say what the collision rules are. It's a distribution. Once I come with this velocity, there will be a distribution of outgoing. This is in physics, we call it, we call it differential cross section, anyway. So that was done by Galavotti and Spohn. There is some more results here by Bolvigini, Bulimovic, Sina, I'm not going to speak about. And here I speak about the distribution, the collision rules, which there is an explicit formula for the collision rule. And once you have this, this is actually, this is a random walk. So what Galavotti and Spohn proved that in this limit, you get a random walk. Then of course, as I told you, for, for random walks, we have central limit theorems. So in these two steps, 
we could prove the central limit theorem. But this is not very satisfactory because, because you would like to do it in one step, not just once reduce the random walk, then use what you did for the random walk. But one, one want to do, I, I would like to do better. I would like to interpolate somehow between what I called holy grail. Holy grail was just looking at the scaling limit without shrinking the, 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 the without doing this Boltzmann graph type of thing. And that's out of reach. And this is partly done, partly more or less straightforward. So can we just interpolate between what is done and what is the holy grail? And that's my result. And here is the theorem, which is in this paper, which I speak about. And the theorem is the following. The theorem is the following. Look at this problem I mentioned. So let me go back a little with my slides. This is the problem, right? Randomly placed scatterers, random initial velocity. You start from here and fly as you can. Perform the Boltzmann grad limit. This is the Boltzmann grad limit. So let take a limit when the density goes to infinity, but the, the, the radii go to zero in such a way that this product converges to one. But don't stop at a finite time, as, as it was done by Galavotti and Spohn. I go to the theorem. Look at infinity. You look at long time scales. Look at much longer time scales. And what I can do is time scales of order. No, I can't do better than that, but at least I can do that. Go up to time scales, not compact, not a fixed time scale. Time scales of order, as you see here, uh, t, uh, so this goes to zero. So time scales of order one, over, essentially one over r squared. There is some logarithmic correction. Anyway, I don't have time to explain logarithmic correction. One over r squared. So it's just quite long. R goes to zero. So this is very long time scale. And look at the look at the process now. Up to that late time. And the trajectory rescaled. So that means the time is shrinking down. And the position is scaled like, like, in, like in the random walk you do. And what we prove is that under the scaling, we get the Wiener process as a limit. Now, what is, what is the novelty here? The novelty is the following. You will see also in the idea of the proof. I go backwards now in my slides a little. I told you that originally Galavot and Spohn did it for compact times. Now, if you do the Boltzmann grad limit up to compact times, actually the memory is swept out because it is it, ha it happens that in this limit, up to any finite time, you will not recollide, for example, you will with very small probability, so probability of, of, of meeting of coming back to a scatterer you have seen before goes to zero. This is part of my proof too. So therefore, up to this time taking Boltzmann grad limit and up to this time, there is the difficulty caused by the long memory is not there. And this is such a time scale that already you see the collisions, already the memory matters. So the difficulty, the mathematical difficulty is already there. So this is, that's, that's why I would love to prove such a theorem for even longer time scales, but I'm not able because my methods are, not, are good for that much and not better. But nevertheless, this was a breakthrough because since, for, for decades, there was no progress in this problem. And, and this is the first time that there is a theorem like this proved when, when, when a limit theorem is proved on time scales, which increase to infinity. Good. And here are some remarks, namely that up to time scales shorter than this, but still very long, namely one over R. My method gives the result of Galavotti better than Galavotti at Berger and Spohn just drops out. So similar things happen as in a Galavotti Spohn. I'm not going to, okay, I will tell you some details. So up to still very long time scale, of, but much shorter than the one I am after. Uh, the problem is not that difficult actually, but still very instructive. 
The result can be extended to any dimension. I do it in three dimensions. For some reason, it can be extended to any dimension in greater than three, but cannot be done in dimension two. In dimension two, I can't go beyond that time scale, still with some logarithmic correction. For some reason, which I don't have, I don't have time to explain, it has probabilistic and geometric reasons why in dimension two, a much lesser result can be only two. And I have time to explain the idea. I certainly I'm not going to enter into, into technical, much technical details because that, that's too much. But I can tell you the idea of the proof. And that's that doesn't need to do. I okay, so a few more slides. There is something in probability we call a coupling, which means the following that that we want to understand some random phenomenon which is very difficult. And there is some random phenomenon which we understand better and we want to compare the two things. And the coupling means that you try to realize the two phenomena on the same probability jointly on the same probability space. So an, on an enlarged probability space, try to define both, but not independently that, that would not be very useful because you want to you want to conclude from knowing one of them, you want to conclude something for the other one. So you have to be clever how to, how to realize the joint distribution of these two random objects in such a way that the two are sufficiently close in, in a sense that it is useful. And that's the coupling I do. Namely, I realize the deterministic process. I mean, where the randomness is only initial condition. And the random object y, which maybe I didn't tell you in detail, but let me go back because probably I should have told you. I didn't tell you in detail. My in three dimensions, in three dimensions, my random process, which is easy and to which I want to compare the deterministic physical process, will be just a random walk in three dimensions. And in, as it follows, this flies at independent exponential times in some direction. Then it renews in three dimension, it simply independently renews direction uniformly, then flies an exponential time, independently renews uniformly, because in three dimensions, you see this exponent will be zero. So this renewal of velocities will be very simple in three dimensions. This is a this is a miracle in three, a geometric miracle in three dimensions. And uh, that's a very simple random move, which I understand perfectly well. And and the coupling is that I have this random walk, which I understand absolutely well. And I have the physical Lorentz process, which I call Lorentz process, the physical process, which I don't understand well at all. But I try to realize the two jointly in such a way that they stay as close together as they can. And in particular, denote by u the velocity of the random process. That means these constant velocities which change within exponential times. And denote by v the velocity process of the deterministic process, which is still constant, piecewise constant, but the collisions are deterministic collisions, right? And what I claim, and I will show you next, not right now, but next, that indeed, given Given the process yt, the random process yt, I have a clever way to construct the physical mechanical process xt exactly using those data. But I warn you from start that I will construct the process and also the environment. So I will not start with the environment from start fixed, but I will explore the environment and put down the scatterers when I first meet them, right? And I will be able to, to realize the two using exactly the same probabilistic input so that up to time one over R, they simply go together. They, there is no difference that the two go together with overwhelming probability. So that's a theorem that with probability going to one in my coupling, the velocity processes will be simply the same. They go together up to that time. Right? 
But in, all, in times of order one over R, some type of mismatches happen. And then I have to do something to have them back again together. I mean that the velocities are together. Once they went apart, they will not go on the same trajectory, but in parallel trajectories. And they go apart again a little, then they go on parallel trajectories. That will be the construction. And you will see how. And, and the idea is if I'm able to do that, if I'm able to do that, so the point is the following, that the coupling will be such that these two velocity processes, <clears throat> there are some mismatches, there are some events which take them apart, but this will occur with frequency r. That means once in a time one over r. And the coupling will be clever enough so that after a mismatch occurs, so the two velocities are different, within time of order one, they will be recoupled to go parallel, to have the, velocity, the same velocities. And these, of course, this will be the clever thing to do. I didn't tell you yet how I do it. But once I'm able to do that, here is the sketch of the proof. If I'm able to do that, then up to time, up to time, I don't, yes. Up to time of order one over R, there was no mismatch. So the two simply go together. And that's, that's how up to time one over R, if I have limit theorem for Y and the two go together, then of course I have a limit theorem for X as well. Later, I will have mismatches, but note that mismatches occur once in a time of order one over R and they are rearranged to go together after a mismatch within time of order one. If you do some careful computations, which I do here and I don't bore you, bother you now to follow, then you will see that the properly scaled processes, so this is the physical process, this is the random walk process, but scaled diffusively. If I don't, so if this capital time T, which is the, the time scale until which I can do it, if this is such that this product you see here goes to zero, and this tells you exactly that capital T of R must be less than one over R squared, I mean less in order than one over R squared, then the scale process stay, stay together. It's not the case that they stay together, they are stuck together as they are up to time one over R, but they stay close to each other, sufficiently close to each other in order that if I have a central limit theorem for this guy, I can conclude a central limit theorem for that guy. And if I have time left, Pablo, how much time left do I have? Negative? Uh, no, you, you have a couple of minutes, yes. Okay, let me just tell you the idea of the coupling. I don't go into any technical details, just what is the coupling? And once I tell you what these two slides I show you, nothing else, just the two slides, two slides which come. The coupling is the following. As I told you the story of the, Brown, of, of, the, of the Lorentz process, I told you that place the scatterers, let the scatterers be there, and then start the, mo the motion of the particle and collide. But what I do is not this. I do something equivalent to this, but not this. Namely, I explore the environment. Namely, I place a scatterer there when first met. I don't know about, about areas which I have not visited yet. I don't know, I don't have any information. When I arrive there, then I keep track that I have been there. I know that there is a scatterer there. I know that I flew on this corridor and I didn't see a scatterer. So I know there are no scatterers here. I know there is scatterer there, but I don't know anything about that area because I have not been yet there. So the idea is to use the randomness of the random walk process yt and to explore the environment to build up what is in the environment using that information. Whenever I fly on unseen, yet unseen or virgin area, whenever I fly on virgin area, I, I, I'm behaving like a random process because I have unseen territory ahead. I fly and I expect to meet a scatterer somewhere, but that's exactly like 
expecting an exponential, an exponential ramp clock to ring. Once I'm there, I put a scatterer and the scatterer is there forever. So if I come back to those territories, then I feel I have the, I have, I have the memory. So this is what I'm doing. This is in plain words, but formally can be written down. So the, the message, take home message is rather than create the environment from start and let the particle move around, explore the environment, right? And the difficulties are on these two pictures. And then I finish my talk. Namely, the yellow one is the brown, is the, is the Markovian. The yellow one is the pro probabilistic object, is the random walk. That's what the probabilist does. And the green one is the constructed physical object. And you see, the yellow one just travels as she wishes. That means fly exponential time, fly exponential time, fly exponential time, change random and fly exponential time. And I try to mimic with the green one, fly exponential time. I know I had a scattering here. I place this first scatterer and that's there for a life. Fly exponential time, this is corresponding to this. Place the scatterer and that's there forever. Now I continue like that, that, fly, fly, virgin territory, now, it was, so the, 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 the Markovian particle flew that way and it, this guy tries to imitate, but recollides, that's the memory. Now, if it recollides, it has to follow the rules, it has to scatter off. So this is a mismatch. This, here a mismatch occurred, here a mismatch occurred. But as I fly next, and this guy flies this way, so the velocity, the velocities are not parallel anymore. When the new instruction comes, namely this guy got the instruction that now change velocity that way. I try to mimic that. I take exactly the same instruction. If I'm on virgin territory, I may do that. And I take this instruction and I'm again parallel to it, but I have to place a new scatterer. These scatterers are there. So this is a mismatch and this is a recouple. And another thing can happen, another problem can happen, namely that mind, this guy flew, say, this guy flew, let, let me follow this one. So fly, this is, this is the Markovian, he does or she does whatever she wants because there is no physical obstruction for them, right? That means there are the instructions coming, try to, try to mimic, try to mimic, try to mimic, try to mimic, but mind, here at this point, the Markovian guy got the instruction to change velocity like that. But the physical guy cannot do that because there is memory. I knew, I know that I've been in this corridor already. Oh, sorry. I know that I've been in this corridor already. I cannot place red scatterers because this, if this scatterer were there, then I would have met it before. So I have to continue, I'm not allowed to, I'm not allowed to do what is instructed. I have to continue. But when the next instruction comes, I'm very likely to be in virgin territory and to take the next instruction. And I'm recoupled, parallel. Now, this is the story told in plain words. Now, if you want to do it mathematically rigorously, there is a lot of work. So it's technical thing. There is geometry. There is probability and geometry coming. So uh, it's... Okay, I think I stop here because whatever next I could do is very technical. I gave you the idea of coupling. I just trust me that there is hard probability and hard, I mean, green function estimates and analysis. And there is also a counterpart, the geometric counterpart, the recollision I have to prove, for example, that I can't be stuck for too long time between two scatterers, which sounds like trivial, but it needs a proof. So indeed, I have to prove that whenever the new instruction comes, I'm very likely to be able to take the new instruction and to recouple. It can go wrong. So things can go wrong in the way that I, I, here was a mismatch. And at the next point where I want to recouple, I'm again not allowed to do it because I'm still somewhere stuck between two scatterers. So these need treatment. It's long, it's technical. But putting all these things together, this is the main idea, putting all these things together, you can go that far in time, not further.
And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Valint. If you want to put yourself in view. Uh, yes, I want to, to, to stop sharing, you say? Uh, oh. Okay. Is, uh, to, uh, thank you very much. Yeah. So uh, is there uh, any question or comment? I have a question. Right. Pablo. Pablo Groisman, yeah. Yeah. Hi, Valin. How are you? Hi, uh, I'm Good to see you. Same on this side. So thank you very much for this uh, amazing talk. I enjoyed really a lot, uh, both the first part and the second part, like amazing. Uh, I have just uh, one question is, uh, so you said that the, the periodic case is uh, much uh, better understood. And I, I was curious about what, what about if you, if it is just the, the, the fact, just the fact that this periodic or it is that the lattice, like what, what about if, you, for example, you- No, 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 the, no, 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 it's periodic. The per it, uh, so say you have a left, you can you can do other periodic arrangements too. Actually, actually, sometimes okay, yes. So Either can you do can you do for for example you choose like a, a random patch and then you periodically you repeat this. Yes, random? yes, yes, yeah. Okay, you have to exclude some things, but things which happen with zero probability. So. Yes, like like any you need pattern, something. You, so you, you need like, you need this this picture. By the way, if you just do it this way, you can get into trouble, and I can I can tell you why. And we have another paper about this, but I'm not going to speak up. Namely, better you place pe periodic placement such that there, there are no infinitely long or unbounded long straight lines allowed. So place a big ball here inside. Do it periodically. I can't do it now, but this way. You understand what I mean? Yes. Because, because in this particular picture you see here, you can fly very, very long without scattering. And that will cause uh, an anomalous behavior, a logarithmic correction in the central limit theorem. So if you want a central limit theorem without logarithmic, or just as you wish, as you know, with square root of time, then you have to do it what we call finite horizon. That means that the scatterers are periodically arranged, but in such a way that there is a supreme, there is a maximum, finite maximum of, of straight path altogether. Yeah, so, but answering your question, yes, any kind of, so just periodicity matters, not, 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 uh, not this particular. And uh, what is, of course, okay, in the periodic case, there was Sinai and Bunimovic back in the 80s, early 80s, they proved, of course, this was the most, the first big breakthrough, it's quoted here somewhere, 1980, in two dimension, they proved the central limit theorem for the uh, finite horizon case. So when, when you don't have infinitely long paths. And the three dimensional, it's a long story, but there is the, 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 the latest or the, the, the most sophisticated result is this chernov dolgopiat but it's not fully completed, the three-dimensional. There are some conditions there which are, so it's a conditional theorem. So the, the central limit theorem holds if some geometric thing, I'm not a specialist of this, but it's not like if the two look, have a periodic arrangement with finite horizon, then the central limit theorem holds. There is nothing, no result like that in three dimension. If there is some condition holds, which is, as I understand, not fully checked, some geometric condition, uh, then so it's 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 not it's much better understood, but not. But let me emphasize that the, in all these uh, periodic arrangements, hyperbolic dynamics is what what is it? And it's a totally different story. It's not, and in in the random arrangement, we don't have any reduction to to uh, actually. It's more probabilistic, the problem, if you wish, is more probabilistic because the, end, the initial condition is probabilistic. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that was my, my second question. So in, in your case, so I, 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 I can see that, the, I mean, in the periodic case, it's, about, it's uh, uh, like much more about like uh, hyperbolic dynamics, as you said. So in your case, there is, do they play a role or there is like nothing to do with that? It's like uh, essentially- I don't, I can't use any, anything like hyperbolic dynamics. I'd have to use some geometric argument, of course, because you can't 
get rid you cannot get rid of some geometry for example when exactly imagine that that these are very, these two scatterers are very close and there are hundreds of of collisions between them of course by hyperbolicity you can control that that it, that the trapping time is not enormously long so there are some elements of hyperbolic motion there but not how should i put it it's it's not about hyperbolic dynamics there are some geometric arguments yeah. but not about hyperbolic understood thank you any other question yeah okay Maybe I have have one. Yeah, you have it? Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, actually, I remember. Uh, Balint, you said you could prove this in higher dimensions, uh, yeah. even if you lose this property that, that your the distribution of the velocity be, become uniform, right? Yes. There is, you need a Dublin argument. So you see, the, I understand your question because uh, it's very natural. Let me go to the, yes. So this is, this is what we call the scattering uh, how, how differential cross section. So this means the following that if you come with velocity v, arrive with velocity v and scatter, then the distribution of the outgoing velocity will be proportional to this uh, will be proportional to this uh, to this kernel. You have to normalize. Mm -hmm. This is computable. This is actually easy to understand. Take us this is a good homework actually. Take a spherical scatterer. Let a particle come horizontally, but randomly you don't. So you have a cross section, and in this tube, it comes this way, but it's uniformly distributed where? But that's what we call the impact parameter. You understand what I mean? So then the outgoing distribution of velocities will be this. Mm -hmm. yeah? Now, in, in three dimension, it has. Minus if it happens in three dimensions, it's uniform. The outgoing is uniform, no matter. So that is no matter how you came in, it will be uniform. In two dimensions, in two dimensions, give me a second. Uh, in two dimensions is V minus V dot. Yeah, so what, what happens here, give me a little time to understand what I mean. Yes, in in higher dimensions, in higher dimension, in more let's say in four dimensions, the den this density will be bounded from below, a positive number, mm -hmm. right? If I'm not, I'm right, am I right that v minus v prime to the minus one is bounded from below? Since it's bounded from below, that's like you have a Dublin argument, the Dublin type of argument. Dublin's argument says that, okay, you remember how Dublin proves central limit theorem for Markov chains or exponential convergence of Markov chains? Namely, if you have a lower bound on the density of, of the kernel, then you can you have a, a clever coupling argument which tells you that in exponential in a exponentially short time, so exponentially tight, exponentially tight time, you can find the stopping time when you are randomly distributed. That's for the so anyway, that type of Dublin argument can be can be used for 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 the kernel in three and more in four and more dimensions. You will not have independent independent velocities, but you have a a very well controlled Markovian change of velocities. And the probabilistic arguments we use is these, uh, how we, what are the green function estimates mm -hmm. work. It's harder work, but can be done, but can be done. In two dimensions, in two dimensions, it's slightly different because in two dimensions, if, if D is two, then you don't have a lower bound on the density and density goes down to zero. So Dublin doesn't work directly, but you can notice in two dimensions that two consecutive, if you convolve this kernel with itself twice, that will have already a lower bound. So you have to do something a little bit more complex, take two consecutive changes of velocities and apply the Dublin argument for the two consecutive ones. It makes it a bit more complicated, but it can be done. So, 
So this is, I don't know, did I answer? I didn't even wait. Yeah, no, I-, I To answer your question before you asked the question. Did I guess your question? That was part of it. And the second one is, well, the same question is, in higher dimensions, can you take advantage of the fact that you have more, some renewal argument to restart your argument later on? Yes, and yes, there you is? can take, yes, but it's not big advantage. I tell you what the result will, how the result will differ. In higher dimension, instead of this square, the, forget about the logarithm, that's, that's, that's just the correct one. So instead of R squared, it means times of order, long times of order, one over R squared, we do it to long times of order, one over R to the D minus one, so longer time. But there is no good, no new idea. The idea is the same. So it's not the case that it's, we never wrote it down, of course. So the paper is written in three dimensions because it would be just too long and too complicated. And there is no new idea there, just it happens that in higher dimensions, you have something helps more and you can do it for longer. If we got, the big thing would be to go beyond this time. There is a very good reason why this is the time scale I can go up to and not further than that. I'm not going to explain it now, but in order to go beyond this time scale in three dimensions, some really good, some really fundamentally new idea would be needed, not just technical improvements. Any, any other question? I have, have a short question. I, do you have this um, Markovian flight uh, process as a limit of the periodic case also? Uh, no, 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 that's, that's an interesting thing. That's an interesting thing. That if should be you, zero, right? I try to do some light because here we are, it's, it's dark here in Budapest already. And, uh, that's a very interesting thing. So. The flight process comes in uh, in the Boltzmann grad limit, as I tell, as I told you. So this was the Galactic point. Take the Boltzmann grad limit. You have the flight process. Yeah. You, you, you do, the do the same, same thing. Right? Do the same thing in the in the periodic case. Yeah. Let me go back. Give me a second. I change. I change. I go back to my other slides because that will be helpful now. And let me, God, give me a second. Yes. In the Boltzmann grad, the Boltzmann grad limit, the Boltzmann grad limit, as I said, in the random Lorentz gas case, it, le it leads to, okay. In the periodic Lorentz, because these are the, the, in the, in the random, in the Lorentz gas, if you take the Boltzmann grad limit, then you 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 are you are you, you arrive at this uh, at this flight process. Now, if in the periodic case you take you, you make the Boltzmann grad limit, there is a very very deep result by Jens Markloff and uh, who is a colleague of mine in Bristol, and Andreas Strömbergson back in 2011, where they prove that the Boltzmann grad limit will give rise to a different flight. It's not a Markovian flight process. It's a more complicated thing. Ah. Oh, and it's, it's a very interesting object. It's too late. I, I, I can't speak about that it. Is, they are exponential, but not uh, independent. No, 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 no. They are not exponential flights. They are field flight flights. Ah, OK. They are, it, it's a bit dimension dependent, but there are long, not exponential flights. The Markovian, Markovian character is different. It's a more complicated object. And what we prove in another paper with Jens Markloff, this is another paper that take, take this markov strombergson limit and do as a second step a scaling limit of that process, which is not a Markovian process. It's, it's not like this flight process Y of mine, it's a different thing. Then we will get a, ah, a Wiener okay. process, but with a, you see the logarithmic correction. Okay, so you, you have a, an analog to this flight process but that is not Markovian. Exactly. And it has long the flights. Coupling. Then you do the, your coupling and so the... And in a second step, you do, in a second step, we do this scaling, a limit theorem in this scaling, but note that this is all super diffusive. Hmm. 
dimensions. No, no, sorry. How is it? No, this, these slides are older. It's done in all dimensions. Okay. It's done in all dimensions, not only in the, ah, yes, D larger than two, that's what's written down. In all dimensions greater than, no, it's correct what's written down. In all dimensions, we have this super diffusive scaling limit there. It's an older result, it's, it's a nice thing. There. But it's different. So the Boltzmann graph limit in the periodic, you have some number theoretic uh, things coming in. You have some zeta functions coming in the, in the limiting variance here. So it's, <laughs> okay. Is there any other question? Okay, let's have, thanks, Valent again. Thank you very much, thank you.